You ready? So what I'm going to do tonight is you are going to, uh, we're going to go through a lot of stuff. You know, it's funny that we had to send out the slides again because there's a formatting group that we used to do that. And every time I send in this, they go, you got that many slides? I said, yeah, we got a pretty tough group, though. They've been hanging tough. Nobody jumps on each other. There's no throwing things, you know. I mean, it's pretty good. Front row's a little questionable here, but we're okay. <laughs> got to give Pam a hard time. Okay, are you ready? Let's go to the first slide. Judaism, Islam, history and beliefs, Bible prophecies, that's in March 7. Okay? And I'm also going over Hinduism, which probably didn't get in there on the... Go ahead, next slide. All right, ready? Hinduism. How many are familiar with Hinduism at all or not or anything somewhat? Yeah, okay. Not really, huh? It kind of seems to be way out there. Okay, here we go. 1.2 billion Hindus in the world. That's an approximate. Hinduism is difficult to describe because it has absorbed innumerable customs and branched off into many other religions. So what you're seeing is you're seeing a bunch of gods, a bunch of things in Hinduism. And the pre-Vedic period is the earliest stage of Hinduism. It began around 3,000 years ago in northern India. So if you go to India today and Hindus, you'll see Hinduism here. Uh, and the pre-Vedic period was that. Next slide. Overview. Around 1500 BC, a Central Asian people called Aryans invaded northern India. These people imposed their Vedic civilization and religion on those in India. So here's where Hinduism comes through. It's a very old religion. Next slide. Aryans worship the powers of nature, rather the powers of images. Let's say idols or something. You're worship, you worship nature. You worship the sun. Uh, we have Indra with some of their gods, a the god of the atmosphere. Varuna, a sky god. Agni, the fire god. Now in Moana, that was Polynesian, okay, the culture and religion. But do you pick up on the same type of thing, right? You have a an uh, island god, you have a sun god, you have a tree god, you have whatever they decide to be their gods. Arians created an elaborate system of sacrifices that later led to a priesthood called the Bra Brahmins. Now I go through this pretty quickly because some of you are going, I never heard of this stuff. Yeah. This is true. Remember, you got 1.2 billion people. It's a lot of people. Next slide. Around 600 BC, the Upanishadic period followed the Vedic period, Upanishads. Anybody ever heard of that term? Yeah, that's their, uh, that's their belief system. During this period, Hinduism became more philosophical and became popular with the masses. So you saw it move in through India, and you saw that become um, the main religion. The Upanishads were the sacred books that reinterpreted the Vedic religion to one that put all gods together into an absolute universal soul. So all the gods are together creating an absolute soul. Next slide. During the Upanishadic period, the Hindu concept of salvation changed. It went from its an emphasis on the fulfillment of life to escape and release. And what do we mean by that? Okay, so if you have a life that's based on salvation, it's something that's, that you're changing to, they believe now we need to escape life. So we need to find and escape and release from life itself. So a lot of the meditation, when you hear transcendental meditation, you hear different meditations, these are people getting away from yourself and entering another place that releases you from reality in the world. Something you probably don't do every morning or in breakfast. You go, but you will run into people as you find the branches off of Hindu that are talking about that or you, you see some stuff on it. This is where it comes from. Uh, the doctrines that grew at this time were karma, a moral law of cause and effect where one could either build good or evil karma. How many of you heard that in, yeah, in television or maybe somebody says, that's bad karma. Well, that's where it really comes from. And the samsaras teaches that all life goes through endless successions of rebirth. You ever heard of reincarnation? Okay, and they, they teach that what happens is when you die, you come back as something and hopefully you come back then better than what you were. Otherwise, maybe you could come back as a rat. Or a bug. Or a Democrat. <laughs> yeah, this is going to go on YouTube, so I get to proof it. All right, next slide. 
Hinduism became so philosophical, corrupt, and legalistic in practice that reform movements came out of it. Two of these were Jainism and Buddhism. Now, we could go through and go through all those we didn't, but you know Buddhism, you've heard of that, right? Well, Buddhism comes out of the same type of thing, right? So it's the same type of look for yourself and get into your own meditation and reality of yourself. A triad of Hindu gods was often used to represent the impersonal and absolute Brahman. Brahma was the creator, Vishnu was the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. You will see this in children's, some children's um, uh, movies and things like that. You'll see Shiva listed, preserver. You'll see them use these names if they're into some different culture. That's the culturalism that they're changing. And again, this is a free America. People can make what they want to and can say what they want to. That's not my point. My point is we have to know what it is that's being taught to us and to our kids and family. Big concern for kids and children who have been raised under so much stuff that we didn't even see, and they know about it. I can ask some of the kids. I bet you I could, I could ask some of the kids and give them a test, and I'll guarantee you that they'll know about uh, things like LGBTQ. They'll know about all these things, and that we don't think they know. They know more than you think. That's kind of my whole point, okay? So, next slide. Many Hindus choose to worship the god Vishnu and his ten incarnations. An incarnation is also known as an avatar. Anybody heard of avatars? Hmm. Did somebody just make that name up? No. Who were sent by God to earth to save the world from perils. Some of the better known are Rama, Krishna, and Buddha. Avatars. The Hindus that worship the god Shiva and his wife are called Shivites. The representations of this god can be quite immoral and bloodthirsty. There's a lot of sacrificial stuff and prostitution and things were in that involved in the temples. Next slide. Muksha. Uh, this occurs when a person extends his or her being awareness and bliss to an infinite level. The only way a person can attain Muksha is to come to the realization that his or herself is actually the same as Brahman. So that's the whole idea. You take yourself and you change and you go through these things and you get rid of yourself and you all become one eternal big soul with Brahman. I'm paraphrasing it, but I'm just trying to give you an idea of what it is. Somebody says, do we really have to study this because this doesn't go on? There is more cultural pluralism in this country than we've ever had before, which means it all gets mixed in. You know, you can be a Buddhist and you can want to be an avatar, and at the same time you can claim, you know, you want to be some other religion. And people are taught that you can be whatever you want to be. Ever heard that? Or how about go with your heart? Follow your heart. Ever heard that one? So it's being told to us. Just follow your heart. You'll find it. Next slide. Hinduism overview. Salvation is achieved by detachment from the finite self and then by gaining attachment to reality as a whole. At this point, a person reaches a state of passionless peace called nirvana. Ever heard of that term? I'm reaching nirvana. Could it be a nirvana because I'm reaching that state of perfection? And you may have heard that term, nirvana. Next slide. Hinduism, there are three basic approaches to salvation for Hindus. Okay? And it doesn't agree with the Bible. Salvation by knowledge, called jhana yoga, jhana yoga, is achieved by listening to sages and the scriptures and practicing meditation to realize the Atman Brahma identity. Let me tell you something about transcendental meditation that can be used. When people talk about meditating, okay, many of you maybe heard that where they, they want to meditate. When, there's a difference between meditating on God's word and praying to him than there is what you're talking about in meditation that's in another culture. Meditation is a release of yourself and giving it up. Salvation through devotion called bhakti yoga is when a person chooses a particular manifestation of a God and hopes to break through to a union with God. So as we're sitting there and we're doing meditation, what they want to do is they say, I take on a manifestation of a God. Cults and world religions always have the enticement of you can be a God. You ever heard that term a lot in these religions? You can be, we talked about Mormonism, you can be your own God. So this is the attraction that has it there. Next, next slide. 
And then you can gain salvation by correct works called karma yoga, where one must perform ceremony, sacrifices, pilgrimage, and other good deeds without an attachment to them or expectation of rewards. So that sounds like pretty good. I'm going to continue to do good deeds, and that's fine. You do good deeds, but they expect that I, I, I don't care whether I get rewarded or not. Nothing wrong with that, but that's their belief. It's, it's a, a basic approach to salvation. Next slide. Hindu philosophy considers the world as an intermediate training ground for the soul. What does that mean? Remember we talked about reincarnation? And you can't see you got to go back. So we're like all on this training mission in our life right now. That's what they say. So I'm this life that I'm doing right now before I die and become a squirrel or whatever I become is training me. So if I come back, I want to be a better squirrel than I am now. Hinduism believes that innumerable galaxies are run on the basic of the law of karma. The universe goes through endless cycles of being created and destroyed. So that's what they say is happening in the galaxies. They're all being created and destroyed, created and restored, and it's an endless cycle. A more recent Hindu movement called the Vendanta Society has a missionary zeal. That's just an extra piece. Next slide. Okay. Hinduism, religion, and society are connected within a caste system. Anybody ever heard of a caste system? Yeah. Good people with money, power, kind of next level that maybe is crafts or something. And then the next level is kind of like, well, look at this. And then down below are the majority of people who are just considered to be just lowly people. It's our new government system in America they're working on. Next slide. All Hindus believe that Brahman manifests itself in a multitude of avatars. Avatar is a big word. Avatars are earthly incarnations of gods and goddesses. Anybody like to play video games or get to be an avatar? They don't have avatars in video games, do they? They don't show that online, do they? You don't get to become your own person on AI and artificial intelligence creating yourself. No, none of that really happens. Just turn your Atari on. Hinduism is an extremely idolatrous and polytheistic religion as evidenced by the millions of gods and innumerable temples and cults. They believe in millions of gods. So there's these gods that are going on all the time. Next slide. Some important scriptures of Hinduism is Scruti revealed scriptures. <clears throat> Shruti. Vedas, Brahmams, Upanishads, Bhagavad or Gita. Why do you need to know that? You'll hear it. If you hear it come out and somebody's talking about that, you're going to deny that they have Hindu influence. Okay? Smriti. Can anybody pronounce that better than I can? Tradition is semi canonical. There's a sutras, codes of law, Agamas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Darshanas, and Puranas. The only reason I put that in the notes is again, if you're talking to somebody and they've been talking about, I do a lot of meditation, I've been going over to do yoga class, I've been doing whatever, and you start to hear some of this stuff, just take a look and see maybe where, what they're into. Next slide. One of many gods, Hindus believe in one impersonal God or ultimate reality, we said Brahman, while affirming the existence of a plurality of gods and goddesses. It's estimated they think around 330 million. Wonder what state they're living in. There are four main branches of Hinduism Brahma, the creator god, Vishnu, the preserving god, and Shiva, the destroying god. These are usually the gods that you'll see continue talked about. Next slide. India has many spiritual leaders called gurus and wandering holy men called sadhus and swamis. You've heard of that? Heard of swamis and other spiritual leaders and gurus. Growing influence of Hinduism in the West includes movements such as transcendental meditation. Hare Krishna, and the New Age Movement. And that actually came out of the book that I'm using here again, Cults and World Religions. Um, and you just see it expanding into other areas. But those are some main areas that they have as far as for those influence. Next slide. With, so now we're going to talk about the biblical evaluation. Uh, anybody think there's a problem with Hinduism and the Bible? Probably an easy one, huh? With philosophical Hinduism, God is generally an it, not a person in the Bible. So if we're talking to them about the Bible or whatever, they think God is an it, right? And meaning that he's not a personal God that we're talking about in the Bible. The multitudes of gods and goddesses in Hinduism makes them polytheistic and idolatrous in their practices. So from the Bible's perspective, what's happening? 
well, worshiping many gods, just like, like there is, and there's also, um, they're polytheistic. Polytheistic means many gods, many. Next, there's no recognition of sin and mortal guilt. Sin is considered an illusion. Ultimately, man is God. That's their belief. Again, some of the same type of stuff where we hear man could be God. Next slide. Popular Hinduism is full of immoral practices, fear, superstition, and occultism. Demon worship and possession by the gods can also be found. So that means if there are people that are involved in Hinduism or whatever, and they come from that type of structure, yes, there is that type of worship. Not in all cases. I'm not saying all Hindus may be involved in that. But that's the culture that comes out of that. And should that shock us? Not really. In the spiritual realm, when people call out to the spiritual realm and give it authority, guess what happens? The bushes get rattled, right? A lot of stuff that's going on, it's real. The caste system is unjust and cruel. Before Hinduism was influenced by Christian ideas, a little attempt to reform the system. India is a very poor nation, and there's a lot of poor people. And actually, there's revival that's coming in with the opportunity for Christ because they're coming in and they're built into this system that they're like down over here, right? They're not even through the incarnate reincarnation yet. And they are so poor and they have such needs. So it's a great heart that you can come in and say, you know what? I got a savior that I know that's real, that lived in, in this, you know, on this earth. And he has something for you. He wants you to be with him. That's, that's so foreign to them. They don't know that. But there's so much need because if you think about being in a caste system. Okay, so there's hurting people, a lot of hurting people. Next slide. Uh, forgiveness of sin does not fit with the belief of karma, the law of cause and effect. Every person has many lives to achieve salvation. Hinduism is a work system. So think about if you have to be able to be saved and you're based on a work system, and that's all you hear, that gets pretty hard and depressing. Particularly if you're told, well, you're going to go through a bunch of recycling time. So you think to yourself, well, I'm never good enough no matter what I do in a work system. And what do I come back as? And what do I have to do with that? How do I reach that potential? It's really a, a real tough place to be for people. Okay, Hinduism despises the belief that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. So if you're talking with Hindus, they despise that. Okay? Next slide. An important issue to deal with in Hindu argument that all religions are the same. Hindus, Hindus feel their religion is superior to Christianity. Why? Because they believe all religions are the same. And that's what the world wants to hear. Doesn't the world want to hear that there's many ways to God? Ever heard that one? How about all of our religions are the same? It's just a choice that we're making. Well, that can't be possible. Not all religions can coexist theologically. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't coexist with each other. And somebody, I'm not talking about that. So somebody can say, well, they chose that religion. Do you hate them? No, I'm not talking about that. Theologically or in truth wise, it is impossible to, to have Christianity where Jesus Christ is the ruler and king of all, and died for the sins and bought us back, and God has all authority as creator, and he has no other gods before him, you don't get to be, well, it's close. <laughs> but that's what the world is telling us. That's what's being said. That's why the Congress gets angry, or certain groups get angry, because they say, you guys are saying that Christianity is better than other religions. Yeah. You're not supposed to say that. You're a hater. Yeah, I'm not a hater. It's truth. Truth is dying inside of the world, and that's exactly what Satan wants. Truth to be hidden, truth not to be told. And you know what? If I really care about somebody, I'm not coming at them beating with a Bible, but I'm saying, you know what? I got to tell you the truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you want to take some time, I can go over with it exactly. You know, look how the Bible has shown about Jesus and, you know, all those prophecies that happened. And he lived here. He reigned. He died. He rose again. That's not even only in the Bible. That's truth. Go check it out. But Jesus never, ever accepted anything other than he is truly God and truly man. 
So that's where everyone, every knee bows, right? If I really care or love about them, why do I want to water it down and say, oh, you're okay with your religion. Don't worry about it. You can have a little Jesus, you can have a little Buddha, have a little Mormon, have whatever you want to have. That's good because you're going to feel good about it and you're going to like me. You know what? When you speak the truth, I, and there's probably a lot of people who don't like me at all. You guys are looking at me. I'm like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> but think about it. You are a wonderful, wonderful light inside of a dark world that we live in. Why? Not because of what you do or I do, but because of what he did. And speaking that truth to people sometimes is going to make them angry. They're not going to like it. But you're not a hater because you want them to go to be all eternity with the Lord. You actually have more love for them than if I was to just tell them what they want to hear. Okay? Hindus call sin an illusion, and uh, that's important to emphasize the real solution to the problem of sin is Christ's atonement for sins. Every human being knows that they've got sin in their life, whether they tell you they think they do or not. God planted it in every human heart, right, that there is a God. We, we got it. I don't care. There's no such thing as saying, well, I'm really a pure atheist. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they can say you're an atheist, which means I don't believe anything. But on the deathbed with an atheist, what are you afraid of? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid if all you're going to do is die and go get buried under a tree? Why are you afraid all of a sudden? Because deep inside, you and I have been given something that says, we have a creator and he made me. It's what I do with them that's the issue. So the point even with Hindus is they are looking for truth, even though they are buried in lies and deception. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide. We need to be careful to explain our Christian terms because they have a different meaning to Hindus. You know, that's another thing we're going to talk about next week. <laughs> we have Christian terms that we know, right? But we can't assume anymore that anybody knows the basic Christian tenets of the faith. I would agree that I would, I would basically argue they don't. So if you say, boy, I want to tell you something. I want to share you the blood of Jesus Christ just came to save me. And man, I was stricken by the Holy Spirit and I gave my life. They're kind of like going, wait a minute, what do you mean, blood, Jesus, Holy Spirit? Here's my point. Doesn't mean you don't tell them about that, but just, just understand that, you know, think about it, sit back and kind of figure out a little bit where are they kind of coming from, and you'll find out. Does that make sense? I hope I don't mess that up. But focus on the authority of the Bible. Hindus cannot accept all the Hindu scriptures because they contradict each other. So Hindus have all these scriptures, right? And they all contradict each other. But you don't have the time to go through all the scriptures and explain to them how they contradict them. We always just point to this as the only thing you need. We already have it. Next slide. All right. <clears throat> you want to do some Judaism? Oh, we're right on time. We're going to get to Islam too yet. So. Okay, now I picked Judaism post AD 70 because I'm believing that most of the people in here were we're maybe raised in the church, maybe some haven't, but we have a Judeo-Christian heritage. If, do you know what that means, Judeo-Christian? It doesn't mean we're in Judaism, but really, we came, Christians, and Jesus was a Jew, we actually, the salvation came through the Jewish nation, and we know them, and God made promises to them. Now, they rejected the Christ, okay, but we are here as Christians today because of the... So most of us know all that. I want to go back through the laws, and you guys know all that. But I did want to pick up what happened to Judaism since 70 years to where they are today that they can be thinking that way. That's what I wanted to cover. So this is, we're doing a few, few slides. There's approximately 15.7 million Jews in the world. When I put a number up there, somebody says, well, do you get it from the book? No, I, I can go online. I can find where the estimates are. I try to give you, you know, you can find four different numbers, but it's pretty close. So 15.7 million Jews in the world. After the destruction in the temple of A.D. 70 by the Romans, remember that? When Rome came in, they destroyed the temple in, uh, in Israel. The synagogues were officially rallying points for Judaism. So we had synagogues, that's where people would meet, okay? And then they had the temple, and the Romans came in and just demolished the temple. And they blamed Christians for burning. Remember, Nero did that. It was a hate. Anyway... So what happened is the Jews then, their synagogues 
actually help them. So when the temple system ended, the system of sacrifices, the synagogue substituted the system of sacrifices with ritual, prayer, and the study of law. So they had the temple where they would do the sacrifices in the Old Testament. That's wiped out. Now what do we do? Well, we'll meet in the synagogues, but since we can't burn sacrifices, we can't do it over, they replaced it by saying we're going to have prayer and rituals and the study of law. So you see how they moved away from that temple. Next slide. Levitical priesthood was replaced by teachers of the law. Many of these teachers, rabbis, were the Pharisees who developed an elaborate oral tradition based on Mosaic law. So as they move into these synagogues, here comes the rabbis and the Pharisees, and they start having a bunch of other written laws. So guess what happens in Judaism? You've got to follow a lot of laws, right? Around 880-200, the oral traditions of the rabbis are written down. It's known as the Mishnah. The Mishnah is considered to have almost the same authority as the Mosaic law. So as time progressed, guess what starts happening? Men start writing laws, right? Then all of a sudden we get another couple, you know, an hour, 200 AD. Here's a Mishnah. That's what we want you to follow. So what are people following? Men's laws. And they say, well, in order to, why you need to follow it? Because we're going to claim it has the same authority as a Mosaic law. Oh, sound familiar? Understand how the process works? I claim to write a scripture and I claim I have authority. Next. Lengthy commentaries on the Mishnah known as the Gemaras were written. The Babylonian Gemara in AD 500 is longer and more popular than the Palestinian Gemara. The combination of the Mishnah and the Palestinian Gemara is known as the Palestinian Talmud. Just for your information, if you were looking at a Jewish nation, that's what they're studying, that's what they're looking at. Next slide. <clears throat> combination of the Mishnah and the Babylonian Gemara is known as the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud has many volumes and contains Jewish folklore, scholarly teachings, and traditions. So you had the, all the rabbis and whatever writing all these rules and all these regulations, and now you're entering into today's Jewish nation. Has anybody, um, have anybody made familiar with Jewish people when they're trying to follow all the laws? What you're finding is even Judaism has gone away from everything, and even in Israel, you're almost becoming secular. Next slide. <clears throat> In AD 135, the Romans drove the Jews out of Palestine. Judaism survived because the Jewish community had at least one synagogue, and each synagogue was directed by a rabbi. So that's how they survived. I have a rabbi, I have a synagogue. <clears throat> synagogue. Rabbids began to address, stress the idea that every Jew had an immediate access to God. Now the Jew no longer needed conversion or redemption. Instead, a Jew could reach salvation by obedience to the law. That's what happened. It went to where I need redemption, I need forgiveness. We get a bunch of rules and regulations, and pretty soon what began to get into you in mind, I'm a Jew. If I'm a Jew, I no longer need conversion, right? I don't need redemption. Instead, I follow the law, and that's going to save me. So what do Jew, uh, in Judaism, what do they believe is going to save them? Legalistic law, Right? Don't need a savior. Legalistic law. Next slide. <clears throat> the rabbis broke the law down in 613 precepts. 365 are negative. 248 are positive. This enabled the Jewish life to become a carefully controlled ritual from cradle to grave. So as you bring up your family from cradle to grave, the rituals of all of the laws are what you're going to follow. A Jewish philosopher named Maimonides, <clears throat> Maimonides in the 12th century wrote a creed generally regarded as the basis of orthodoxy. Why is that important? What you're watching is you're watching us heap more and more and more laws and rules and regulations that uh, they have to f follow as Jews. Next slide. Judaism rejects the doctrine of original sin. Judaism claims that sin is an act, not a state. This makes it possible for men and women to live according to the law. It also eliminates the need for a savior. And many Jews anticipate a messianic age, not the coming of the personal Messiah. Of those who do expect a Messiah, they usually... They think he will be a social or political deliverer, not a savior from sin. So just as before what happened when Jesus came and they wanted him to be, you know, ruler over the earth or over uh, Israel, that's the same thing they think. Next slide. Okay, some important festivals. I'm going to blow through that because you've heard of these. Rosh Hashanah is the New Year festival that has 10 days of penitence and solemnity. The 10th day of penitence is a day of atonement. Only this day, the Jews acknowledge their sins and pray for forgiveness. So this is your day to pray and ask for forgiveness. Festival of Tabernacles, Suffets, or Booths. 
Passover commemorates the Exodus, right? And uh, the Feast of Weeks is Shabbat. Does anybody has anybody heard of any of these? Or you've heard of them, right? And you all know. Does anybody know what they are? What they mean? Or you want me to tell you what they mean? Or do you remember? Don't remember? Okay. Let me get that out here a minute, because I know that the Feast of Tabernacles, and that was the 40 years. Remember when they were 40 years? Okay. So you got the Feast of Booths, a week-long fall festival commemorating the 40 years in the wilderness in the Old Testament. And then you have the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot, which usually incurs late spring, May or 1st of June, and they present the new offerings of grain. Okay, And then Hanukkah, or Shekana, Shanukkah, uh, is eight-day wintertime. We know what that is, right? You light the menorah. There we go. And that's celebrate nightly lighting of uh, the menorah and special prayers and foods. And then go to the next slide, I think. That was where the Hanukkah was. And uh, Purim. And Purim was a survival of the Jews in the 5th century from Persians, as identified in the book of Esther. Remember that? You read the book of Esther, or actually Esther, and that was that saving point for the Jews. So that's what they celebrate in Purim. Purim. They have other festivals, but these are some of the main ones you may have heard of. Judaism today is divided into three main branches. Orthodoxy. There's an ultra-Orthodox form of Judaism within Orthodoxy known as the Hasidic movement. And you've been on a plane, and you see an Hasidic Jew, long braids, you know, that old, old attire, and very, very... Orthodox. It says a Hasidic Jew. Okay? With, uh, and Orthodox Judaism has changed little in the last 20 years. Next slide. Reform Judaism. This is a liberal form of Judaism where the Tal Talmudic practices have been put aside. Reformed synagogues are usually called temples. And the Sabbath observance in many cases has changed to Sunday. So you have kind of a Reformed group there that moved away from some of the normal rules. Conservative Judaism, it retains the feasts and many of the Jewish traditions while cautiously reinterpreting the law to make it more relevant to society. Conservative Jews are very progressive. What a great opportunity when we know the Lord is, always says that there's going to be a gathering of all of his people. And all of his people are based on through Christ, okay, and that's the true Abraham family, is those that through Christ. But there also is a heart for Jews that in turn become part of that. That's part of the gathering. And actually, the Jewish nation needs a Savior. I know with all the things going on, and they, they need a Savior. Because what happens is a secular world comes in. Actually, uh, Israel can be very secular. Okay? Next slide. The Old Testament clearly states, and this is how you respond, that God has chosen blood to be the means of the forgiveness of sins. Isaiah 53 tells us that the Messiah had to die to provide a once and for all. So you know how they say, well, yeah, we had to have sacrifices. That's what God gave. And you say, yeah, God was showing us through all the temple sacrifices and everything in the Old Testament, pointing to who? Jesus Christ. So there you have a chance to go to Isaiah 53 and say, you know the Old Testament, it's right here. Once and for all, Jesus had to die. So you actually have an opportunity to go through Scripture and say, okay, will you believe this? Yes. Because Scripture points to who? Jesus. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So that's a, that's a good thing to remember. Next slide. Over, okay, now we're going we're to go into the one that I think some of you have been interested in. How many know about Islam? So-so. <clears throat> We're going to, uh, I just put everything up here on Islam, okay? So I think you guys know that by now. You just put everything on the board, whether people are going to like it or not. I got to tell you something that's going on in, in just real quick in the, in the Muslim world. Do you know that there are people that are in these countries and not every Muslim, remember, not every Muslim is radical Muslim, okay? So, but remember with over 2 billion people, 10% that are radical is 200 million that are radical. But you can have Muslims that are just, you know what I mean, just ordinary people in the community or whatever, but this is their doctrine, this is where it comes from. You have to, you, we have to understand that. But you think about it, there's Muslims in these countries, in, in the Middle East countries now, that are just praying to God, and they'll come in and they've testified. They testified, I had a 
I just had a dream about having to meet Jesus. And they've become Christians. We didn't even make it out there. And you, you listen to the stories of uh, when Vicki and I were in, uh, uh, were in Texas. We had a, a dinner of people that would come over from other countries and share about their country. And one guy got up and he said, I got to tell you, I can't believe what we're doing as a group in this room. You guys are all singing. He said, yeah. He says, what do we have to do? We all get in our car and roll up the windows. Because if they hear us singing Christian songs, we're dead. And you had guys get up and said, by the way, I lost my friend last week as a martyr. So Islam is a monotheistic faith based on the revelations of their prophet Muhammad during the 7th century in Saudi Arabia. How many have heard of Muhammad? Okay, how many know about Muhammad, where he's from, what he really did? Do some people know that? So, so? Okay. The world Islam means surrender or submission to the will of Allah. Muslim means one who submits. Okay? And um, Islam is based and founded on Muhammad and his teachings. Next slide. So extreme is the monotheism of Islam that the greatest and unpardonable sin is shirk, which is associating Allah with anything that is created. So understand what they say. If you associate it other than just God, who's almost untouchable with anything else, like he's personal, then you, you've, you've done the unpardonable. Okay? Also understand that radical Muslims or Muslims were viewed inside Okay, of the Quran, and I, how many people have read the Quran for fun? Yeah, you've read it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you read the Quran. And we're called infidels, and we're going to find out why. Yeah, an infidel is somebody that's against the religion, okay? And, and radical Islam not only hates Israel because of a reason with it, they also hate Christians because of that conflict, okay? They do. Now, that, I, again, I didn't say every Muslim who's a Muslim in your community hates you. I'm not saying that. There's radical Islam. This is the piece that we have to understand is the basis inside of Middle Eastern conflict between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and different groups, okay? So Islam combines elements of the Old Testament, Christianity, uh, Christianity Islamic sects, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, and John, and other prophets of Allah. They can't deny Jesus was a prophet. I mean, you can't. They can't either inside of their history. So they look at the Old Testament and they say, yeah, we'll go with them. But here's the deal. Islam claims that Muhammad, the original name Abu Qasim, 85, 70 to 63, was the last and the greatest of the prophets and the greatest man to ever live. So once again, guess what happens? Yeah, you had these prophets, but guess what we got? We got the prophet that is really true and is really better than anybody else, and his word lasts. So they believe that Muhammad in the Quran is, is uh, the best prophet that there is. Okay, next slide. He was born in Mecca, near the southwest coast of Arabian Peninsula in A.D. Uh, 570. His father, Abdullah, died shortly before his birth, and his mother, Amina, died when he was six years old. Somebody said, why do you give us all this information? because you'll be able to see how his life unfolds in collecting with other religions where he lived. His grandfather cared for him for a short time, and then he was brought up by his uncle, Abu Talib. Okay? Abu Talib. Next slide. He became a camel driver and went on through many lengthy caravan journeys. During these journeys, he engaged with people of different religions and nationalities that later influenced his thinking. So here he is again in this major trade center with all these religions coming from all over, and that influenced him, okay? Age 25, Muhammad was employed by a wealthy widow on a caravan trade named Khadijah. I think that's how you say it. He served her so well that even though she was 15 years older than he was, she, she decided to marry him. So he got married. Next slide. Together, they had only one daughter that survived. They had children that did not survive, and her name was uh, Fatima. Okay? As Khadijah's husband, Khadijah's husband, Muhammad didn't need to work anymore, so he began to spend time meditating and reflecting on the meaning of life. So remember, if you find a rich wife, <laughs> got a lot of time in the truck, or you got a lot of time on the hill, you can start writing, okay? And that's what he did. He really said, I'm going to find the meaning of life, 
okay? And Mecca was a religious center of 360 shrines and a small temple known as the Kaaba that housed the black stone. It was believed that this black stone was given to Abraham by the angel Gabriel. Okay, so in Mecca, here he is in Mecca, and he really is bothered by all this religious shrines. It really bothered him, which drove him to the monotheistic uh, writings. Next slide. Muhammad was disturbed by the polytheistic idolaters of his countrymen, and he concluded that Allah was the one true God. Is Islam's God the same as the God of the Bible? No. You won't hear that, though. In pluralism in America, we all serve the same God. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Mormon, doesn't matter. We all serve the same God, which is a lie. Uh, Muhammad spent many hours in thought in a cave in Mount Ira. Now, here's where the Quran was written. In, six, in AD 610, when he was 40 years old, Muhammad began to receive frightening revelations were accompanied, which were accompanied by violent seizures. Muhammad himself said, I'm not sure if I'm dealing with a demon or I'm dealing with God, but he did have violent seizures. In the book here, um, uh, Kenneth Boa wrote, and including in those seizures, were foaming at the mouth. Which you can refer to Matthew as which one you think it was. Next slide. Muhammad was not sure if the visions he was receiving were divine or demonic. He wrote that himself. His wife encouraged him to submit to the revelations which were supposedly coming from the angel Gabriel. So, blame it on the wife. <laughs> You're going to write that down, aren't you? He said, blame it on the wife. No. But that's, that's really what it was. He's saying, this stuff's going on. She goes, follow it. You know what I mean? This is, this is the right path. He was told to recite the revelation he received, and his followers recorded these revelations as well in the Quran, uh, or, which means recitation after his death. So that's how we get the Quran together. His writings and his disciples also wrote down some of the revelations, and that's what you have as the Quran today. As a prophet of Allah, Muhammad received visions for 22 years until his death in A.D. 632. 22 years of visions, and you have Islam that's being formed and written by Muhammad. Next slide. Muhammad's first co convert was Khadijah, and his second was Ali, a young cousin. Probably the most important convert was Abu Bakr. Muhammad had little success in gaining followers when he openly proclaimed his message of Allah. Businessmen in Mecca depended on pilgrimages to the shrines in Mecca, and everything Muhammad taught was against the moral and social order of Mecca. So he starts getting himself in trouble, right? He starts going into Mecca, and he says, hey, we have Allah, one God. Well, these guys are making bucks on these shrines and pilgrimages, right? And they're going, so he's not finding any followers. Next slide. Muhammad's followers were persecuted. Muhammad was pro protected because of the influence of his uncle, Abu Talib, and his wife, but they both died in A.D. 620. Next, uh, next one, opposition to Mecca became so great that Muhammad left and became a leader of the city of Yathrib. On July 16, 622, Muhammad and Abu Bakr hid in a cave for three days because of a plot to kill him. Muhammad's escape to Lathrib was, Lathrib was called the Hegera, or Hijra. So if you hear that word, Hegera, when they have different things they're celebrating, that's what that comes from, is Muhammad's flight. Okay, next slide. Muslims reckon their calendars with the day using this designation as A-H, A-H, okay, A-H. So the Muslims will follow a calendar that says A-H, that's from the flight, all right? The city of Lathrib was changed to Medina, the city of the prophet. Muhammad was successful there. He set up a theocracy, combining the new religion with politics. Muhammad was both king and prophet. He used his divine revelations to establish new laws and policies. In Medina, he started a harem with 10 to 12 wives. Throw that one in there. Next slide. Muhammad attempted to win over the Jewish population in Medina, but when he was rejected by the Jews, he began persecuting them. He also quit praying towards Jerusalem and began to face Mecca when he prayed. So if you, if you see somebody in Islam or a Muslim who is praying, they're praying over to, Medeca, no, uh, to Mecca, no longer Jerusalem. Okay? Muhammad grew the treasury of Medina by plundering the caravans of the pilgrims that traveled to Mecca. This led to war with the people of Mecca, Muhammad's years were entailed almost in constant warfare. 
So Muhammad is in warfare all the time, and he's plundering the caravans, and that's how he gets, that's how he gets the wealth. Next slide. You guys are thinking, this is a lot of information on this guy. Muhammad finally took Mecca. He tore down the idols and rebuilt the Kaaba with its black stone. By continuing the ancient pilgrimage to Mecca, Muhammad made Mecca the most holy city of Islam. So if you're dealing with somebody in Islam, they'll hear him say Mecca. That's why by the time of his death in AD 632, he was ruler over all Arabia. So he now has control of Arabia. You know, you talk about conflicts with Israel, and you talk about the Middle East conflicts. Abu Bakr was his successor, a caliph. That's what they call a caliph, and he died in AD 634. I'm going through this for a reason. We'll get there, and you'll see the two different sects that divided in here. Next slide. Omar was a second caliph, and he reigned for 10 years. Omar was very aggressive, and his army spread Islam by the sword. They defeated Jerusalem, Syria, Persia, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. So here comes the caliph, and they just are start going into the whole Middle East, and it's all being taken over uh, by Muslim. Uthman and Ali were the third and fourth caliphs to reign. During their regions, Islam spread until it took parts of India, all of North Africa, and a part of Europe. So look at the map as we're talking about the control inside of the Middle East area. They might have conquered all of Europe if it were not for Charles Martel's victory in the Islamic forces at the Battle of Tours in AD 732. Maybe if you went history or world history, you found out where there's where they had the battles as they were trying to go through Europe. Next slide. The Quran is the authoritative scripture of Islam. It's broken down into 114 surahs or chapters. Parts of the Quran were written by Muhammad, and the rest was based on oral teaching that was written from memory by his disciples after Muhammad died. In later years, additional sayings of Muhammad and his early disciples were compiled of the Hadith, which is tradition. These sayings are called Sunnah, custom, the Hadith supplements the Quran. So today you have the Quran, and then you have the Hadith, which is other writings and supplements that people will read. Next slide. Allah is one true God. Here's the five doctrines of Islam. Allah is one, one true God. Muslims believe the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is polytheistic. Okay, so... That means if we believe in the Trinity, we don't believe in the one true God. We believe in many gods, is what they say. Allah is considered to be so holy that he's practically unknowable. So when somebody who's in Muslim or studying in Muslim, Allah to them is so holy that we really can't know him. So there's a void in their life. Muslims claim Allah has sent many prophets to guide men. Some say over 100,000. So they believe 100,000 prophets are somewhere on there, except... Muhammad is always the best. The Quran mentions 28, mainly from the Old and New Testaments. Jesus is considered to be a sinless prophet, but Muhammad is the greatest of all prophets. So they can't deny the truth, and they have the history of Jesus Christ, and they have had it, but he's not as good as Muhammad. Next slide. The Quran is considered the most important of the four inspired books, and it's considered to be eternal like Allah. So they say the Quran is eternal. Uh, the other three books are the Torah, the, which is the Pentateuch of Moses, Zabor, Psalms of David, and Injil, the Evangel of Jesus. Muslims consider these last three books to be in corrupted form, so the Quran supersedes them. So when you had people come up and say, well, you believe in parts of the Bible, they say, well, not really, because it's corrupted, except for the Quran. Muslims believe that there are angels, including fallen angels, called jinn, or demons. The ruler of jinn is known as Iblas or Shaitan. And I may be saying that wrong. I know who it is. It's Satan. Next slide. Muslims believe in heaven and hell. They believe there will be a day of judgment and a resurrection. The deeds of each individual will be weighed on a pair of balance scales to determine his or her eternal destiny. In addition to the five doctrines, there is commonly held a sixth doctrine called Kismet, Kismet which is fate. Okay. I didn't get into what men get, a, uh, get when they get to go to heaven. There's special women for men in heaven. Next slide. There's five pillars of Islam or the main religious practices of the Muslims. The recitation of Islam's creed, the shahada, or word kalima. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. It's repeated several times a day. So if you're somebody, you know, uh, praying, that's what that's about. The practice of prayers five times per day, sunrise, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset, and before they're going to bed. They recite pres pre prescribed prayers in Arabic. 
facing Kaaba in Mecca. Have any of you seen that sometimes if you've gone out in the, you know, you're in the plane or, you, you know, or maybe you're in the airport and you see somebody pull out a prayer you know, a rug or something and then they're praying to Mecca at that time. Okay? Next slide. Practice of almsgiving, almsgiving. The month of fasting is Ramadan. You're probably familiar with that term, Ramadan. Uh, the pilgrim to Mecca, the Hajj. Muslims are required to take this trip at least once in their lifetime if possible. This trip helps one attain salvation. Okay? A sixth that's often added is this is the one where we really get into what we're seeing, and that is a religious holy war called jihad. Anybody heard of that term? Jihad. So that's what you have going on all the time over there. So a holy war can be something that says, you infidels, we're against you if it's radical Islam, and that means jihad, we can do whatever we have to do. Force is sanctioned to spread Islam and overcome infidels. Fourth is okay. We'll talk about Hamas a little bit next week. Next slide. Two major sects of Islam are divided in the question of who is rightful successor to uh, Muhammad. This is all, we're only going to have 30 slides next week, trust me. It, it's important, though, to understand this because there's two sects of S-E-C-T-S of, of Islam that are important because it, we're going to see about how destructive the one side is and why they're doing it, and then another side that's also destructive, but thinking differently. Okay, the Sunnites, by far the majority of Muslims, claim that the rightful successors to Muhammad were the four caliphs. That's what, have everybody heard of Sunnites, the Sunni, Sunni Muslims? Okay. Yes. Then you have Shiites, right? And the Shiites are opposed to this view, believing that only those in the family of Muhammad should be recognized. These successors are known as Imams. Anybody heard of Imams? Mm-hmm. These successors know as Imams, Shiites claim that they were sinless men who performed miracles and are on an equal plane with Muhammad. So that group elevated the family of Muhammad to be right up there with Muhammad. You know the conflict even internally inside of the Muslim nations with that, right? Next slide. Shiites believe that there were 12 Imams and they claim that the 12th Imam disappeared in AD 882. 12th Imam just disappeared, and he will reappear again as the Mahdi, the guided one. You ever heard of that? Probably heard of some of that. And or Messiah and set up his kingdom on earth. So he believes the, Ma the Mahdi is coming, that Imam is coming, and he's going to set up his kingdom to rule the earth. And you can have holy wars and everything to do that. So what's driving these forces that we're seeing are very deep religious convictions that are driving this that don't play the same way that other nations play like Israel. Okay? Next slide. The most important different order that Muslims can belong to is the Sufis. The Sufis are mystics. They have several fraternal orders for the practice of their secret rites. One of the best known of these fraternities is the Dervish fraternity, sometimes called the Whirling Dervishes. Ever heard of that? Whirling dervishes because of their exercises and dances which lead to trance-like states. <laughs> Next slide. Christians should focus. Here's just some things to consider. And we're going to come right in again on time to ask some Q&A. Christians should focus on the problem of sin and what was the God of the Bible has done about it and what Allah has not done. Okay? Now, you're not going to get into that conversation probably until you get a little familiar and knowing some people, you don't just walk in the door and say, hey, you're a Muslim? Well, guess what your leader did? Well, let me tell you about a cave. Let me tell you. No. They, there's a hunger in someone's heart to know who they are and the real Savior. You just got to know that. You never change and accommodate our belief. We don't do that because we don't have to. Okay? Uh, since Islam has many different concepts of God, we must ask questions and determine their particular views of God. When you're dealing with a Muslim, you want to find out what is your view, because it can be all over. Just find out, well, why do you believe what you believe? Not, not in anger, not in viciousness and kindness. You just ask the question, why do you believe what you believe? Remember that a Muslim has no vital relationship with God. In contrast, Christianity is about a personal relationship with God. Next slide. There's a strong culture and political base in Muslim countries. There's also a strong appeal to a universal message which simply creeds and tenets of the faith. 
This is important to remember. They really think their religion is pretty simple. I get to follow the creeds, I get to follow the doctrines, and it's all good. The life of Christ greatly contrasts the life of Muhammad. It should be Muhammad, and of course that's the old spelling. Or Muhammad's household was filled with conflict and strife. He also spent the last 10 years of his life in constant warfare. Okay, next slide. We are done. Next week what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about Hamas. We're going to talk openly about what happened on October 7th. That will include what we seek to be terrible horrors that we're not supposed to talk about. We'll talk about them. And then we're going to talk about, like I said, the four things about, let's look at the end times, what are we doing, and give you eight or nine, ten things. So that's probably going to get me to 30 slides. And you go, how does that dude only do 30 slides? I'll do only 30 slides. And then we're going to have a half hour. Yeah, I'm going to take a half hour to wide open the questions. That's what I'm going to give the time for, okay? And if you don't want to ask any questions, that's okay too. But please feel free to ask them as we talk about not only how do we relate to people, but maybe there's some things that you have questions for. I, I really need to just have that available to you. I may not be able to answer everything, but I can tell you I can get back to you. But I, we spent so much time on going through all of these different religions. Trust me when I tell you, it's not going to necessarily seem it matters. It will. It will, because you now have something in your head. God's given us a wonderful mind that it just pops up and you go, you know what? I need to look that up. That sounds a little different or that sounds a little strange. You have got more training in the last three weeks probably shoved into you than you want. I just think that that's so important in today's world of different religions that we all start to say, you know what? That's not what I have in here that you can stand convicted by the time we know that God has given you everything in your hand for life, for somebody else's life. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit leads you, and it's not praying about how do I go pick somebody off in a different religion. It's about the power of prayer where we as believers pray that the Holy Spirit is just going to tell us and connect us to somebody. It's about us being ready, right? It's about us being ready. So what I'm talking about is not like five steps on what to do with a Muslim or some of this. No, it's here's eight things that we know that the Bible has told us about who our God is. Here are the eight things about what I need to remember for myself, that He is the Almighty. He has everything. He knows everything. And in His heart is a desire that all should come to know Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray that He just brings them to me. And i got to tell you, then you can share the example of what the Lord does because He gets the credit. Because all of a sudden it's like, I never planned on that. So it's easy. It's simple. We're the ones who need to focus on what Almighty God. And everyone in you here, if you're a believer, God has you here for a purpose. And you're going to be able to tell people, not about what you did or what I did, but how it was just an amazing thing that you prayed in the Holy Spirit. And you know what? He gives you the words to speak to, right? He gives you things to remember because you've heard it. And that's why we need to know the Bible. That's why we started with the penance of the faith, because that's what you really need to hold on to. Does that make sense? So that's what I hope to do next week is to walk you through eight or nine of those to where by the time you leave here, you go, you know what, that crazy dude up there trying to show us those slides, he did something maybe right. It's all the Lord, right? It's all the Lord. It's all there. And you're going to be have a wonderful time because I'll tell you, there's nothing greater than a believer who serves Jesus Christ and he watches the miracles that he does. Okay? All right, open mic time. Yeah. Dale, you mentioned that the Allah and God are not the same, although Islam is, a, if I'm understanding correctly, what they call an Abrahamic Abrahamic religion. They right. recognize Abraham, right. but they don't recognize our God as, as <clears throat> Allah is too different. Could you, yeah. Could you give the 30-second version of why Sure. Uh, so understand that if they're reading the Old Testament, remember how we said that they believe in the Old Testament and some of the stuff, but it's been uh, messed up? That's what they say. So Muhammad really is the one that came up with the true prophet teaching of God. And it was Muhammad who came up with the idea that Allah is one main God so holy, so out there that you can't even, he doesn't have a personal relationship with you, right? 
That's where that came from, from Muhammad. If they go to the Old Testament and they believe it was really written, they'll find out, no, that's not true. God was an interactive God. It was working in history. And who does it point to? Jesus Christ. So if you're Muhammad, you've got to get rid of that. And that's exactly what happened. So he created Allah. So that's about 25 seconds. I'll give you another quick one. So, so think of it this way. If I'm, and I'm not, I'm going to be devil's advocate. I'll do that a little bit next week. I'm not the devil's advocate, but I'm going to do that. Okay. If I wanted to stop anything, including the salvation and everything that's going on of God's plan for saving people, a couple of things I want to do. Deception. Deception in who God is and what he did inside of his plan. And that's what I'm going to come up with in the religion. That's a big winner. Second one is you can be your own God. Because the minute you do that with pride or I do that in my heart, guess what? We're separated. So you think of it as a spiritual warfare strategy. Allah is not the same as the God of the Bible who is an all-loving God who created us with a free will, knowing we were going to sin, that he would come back into himself and sacrifice his son so that he could die and buy it back so we can be sitting here today and standing in here today, give him glory because we know where we're going to spend eternity with him forever. You don't have to write that down. Can you, but that's true. Does can, that help? That he's not the same. The world will tell you he's the same. That's what the world says, but he's not. Can you define enlightenment and when did enlightenment come into our culture? Okay. Uh, enlightenment, really in the 17th century, and you hear that, the Enlightenment period. And what they mean from that is during the Dark Ages, you know, when we were in the Dark Ages with the uh, feudalism and everything else. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. With, with, with feudalism and things like that. So Enlightenment became a lot of the philosophers, a lot of the philosophies that you had out of the 1700s, you know, that area. They call that the Enlightenment period. Okay. Enlightenment can mean many different things in different religions, though. Enlightenment is coming to a truth all of a sudden that comes to you. Does that, does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to piggyback on the Allah question over here. So if Allah is this unconnecting, untouchable God, who are they praying to? Huh? Who are they praying to if he's this un Allah. untouchable and unconnectable with? Yeah, well, see, they, they pray to Allah... Okay, uh, but they still treat Allah as he's not personal. He's out there, but I need to pray to him, which is part of the obedience and part of the rules that I'm following uh, as a Muslim for salvation. So it's, so it's I'm, works. I'm, I'm checking off the box. You're checking of off the box, yeah. right? Um, yeah, but no, he's definitely so holy that he's not personal. Uh, it, <clears throat> you touched on New Age movement a little bit. In your opinion, what have you seen the New Age movement impact on, like, the American church or the thought processes of, you know, kind of the normal evangelical Christian? Oh, okay. <clears throat> New Age movement was bigger probably 40, 50 years ago when you heard about it. It's still the same old stuff. Okay, let me, let me, right? Spiritual warfare is, again, I could do a devil, devil's advocate series which I probably shouldn't quote. I'm not meaning that. I mean, you could, if you're looking at it from a spiritual warfare perspective, New Age came into the churches, transcendental meditation, things like that about finding yourself. It got away from the power and, of Jesus Christ and the true gospel, and it became more... more um, it is self-focused. That's just right. Self-worship. And self-worship is human secularism. And self-worship is other religions... And syncretism is what we have today, which means just a smorgasbord or a Burger King of picking whatever you want for your religion. So you're right. They may not call it New Age today, but mysticism is part of that. Okay, and then you can have maybe somebody picks up some Buddha, and maybe somebody then picks up some you know, other Islam, or they pick up Islam, or they pick up something like that. Because you get to pick your religion. That's the new thing they tell you. All religions are the same. We just want you to be who you want to be. Same with truth. Truth is all relative, right? That's what they tell you. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Sure there is. Absolute truth is everything in God. But that has not been taught to us or our children in years. Relative truth affects what you're talking about in churches where everything is kind of relative on certain points. You get a pick. Does that help? 
You're right on the self part. Yeah. Hi. Um, as far as I've been going, kind of studying the Islam, how does, how does um, Hagar and Ishmael relate to that? Okay. If that's okay, that's my... Oh, it's next week. Next week. I didn't mean... It does. Okay. So you have Hagar and Ishmael. Okay. And that was where it was born, not of the promise of Sarah, Israel. Okay. I am going to cover that next week to then show you that the clash that's going on will always be a clash. This idea that they can coexist and they're going to let Israel alone ain't going to happen. Also, I just want to point out that <clears throat> the Madadi, their Messiah, is actually our Antichrist. That's going to be what is? I'm sorry. The, Madi, the Madi. Yeah. The Madi is actually our Antichrist. That's what they believe. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you know, Messiah. I'm not going to get into. First of all, I'm not predicting anything. Okay. I can tell you only what I see. No man knows the time or hour what it is. But they they agree that to be kind of their ruler over the world. That's what they're waiting for. Is the Antichrist going to come out of the Middle East? I don't think so, because it, there's actually a reference coming out of a new global Rome. Could be. I don't, we don't know when. And not the world probably wouldn't accept uh, actually Islamic in itself, but they would accept a global Rome candidate who's all with all the things of, of how you run a world government. Thank you for bringing that up, because we are going to cover that. So I'll cover that in the mosque thing and show that, where that comes in Scripture. Getting back to Hinduism, how do you feel about Christians joining yoga classes? <laughs> I love you guys. You can ask, you know what? I got, I got, and I'm going to talk the yoga thing because people say, well, you know, you're saying a bunch of stuff up here where, you know, you're a terrible guy. Because nobody wants to be able to speak the truth and just talk about it. What is yoga? Okay. So, so somebody, here's, here's, here's the thing, is if somebody's going to a yoga class and it's not really yoga or something, you can't, you can't put everything in a box, right? But yoga is based on the meditation and is based coming out of like Hinduism or other. Yes, it is. Yoga is involved with that. So what would I always tell somebody? You better pray about it. Just pray about it. And no, just pray about it. Do I need to do goat yoga or don't I? Goat yoga, right? Oh, sorry. Because people do do goat yoga, I guess. Can you believe that? I do like hippo. Let's do hippo yoga. So, so anyway, the, the point is remember that for us as a Christian, we don't touch... In ourselves, we protect our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that becomes us knowing in the Word of God that, that, that probably in meditation. I know a lot of people have said, man, when I got into that stuff, it was off the charts. And if that's the case, I would not recommend anybody to do that. I'll go on the record for that. I didn't really answer your question because there's a part in there that, that I, I agree with what you're saying on yoga. But there's such a blending of what yoga is. Some people think it's yogurt. No, that's <laughs> yoga. Okay. I'm, I always want to make sure that we're cautious to find out exactly where that person is so that we can uh, bring them into truth. Thank you, though, for the question. And again, there's no such thing as a bad question. Ask me. I'm, I'm bad at answering, but I can give you a question. Go ahead. So if they call for a holy war, mm -hmm. the jihad, yeah. do you feel like that's just that 10% of the Muslims that believe in that and not the... Yeah, yeah. And I, again, I've heard anywhere from 5 to 10% of what we call radical Islam. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of Muslims that are just trying to go about their day and doing whatever, right? Okay? But when you got that many people, remember, if you have, let's just say it's 5%. So you got only 100 million. Iran, the Persian areas, those countries that are radically run, that's a lot of people. And they're militant inside of that. And also with our situation with uh, 
uh, the wonderful, and this is an opinion, the open border, which essentially is allowing so many different groups into this country now, okay, wide open. Do we ever think that there's not going to be situations against us and persecution? My personal opinion? you got to be kidding me. Seven, eight million, dollar, a million people in here that you used to vet and you're letting go? 50,000 Chinese we estimate now and they all have haircuts and they all flew out here because they don't have any money? Remember, it's a battle. So on your point that you're talking about, yes, that's a serious always... And look at Israel. So that's why Israel and whatever has to fight because they don't, you know, they don't want to come and sing Kumbaya with Israel. They hate Israel. And if they hate Christians, the and they hate are Western here Christians as well. Do a holy jihad as well. Right? Yeah. But I, 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 yeah, this is this always gets like, oh wow, man, what a bummer! You come to this place, make us feel so pessimistic. He is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. He is King of Kings. He owns it all. He's going to stand up and he's going to have us continue to work until he brings every one of his sheep home and gives them to Jesus. So guess what? We all go out as soldiers of Jesus Christ in his power for his glory and we stand in truth. I'm just telling you, they've, not everybody going to like that, but we do it because of the love of God. Thank you for that. Dale, uh, just uh, right oh, here sorry. talking about the um, yoga and then, you know, last week, uh, The Chosen, you know, there's a, a lot of, um, there's just, just little differences, okay? And Satan doesn't need much to get a toehold. Yeah. And so if it's a kind of a yoga that's more of a, um, like a workout and, you know, that's not kind of heavy on meditation, you yeah. might think that's, Okay, not bad, but still. It's touching you're, on you're, it. You're, you're, you're opening that little window for yep. Satan to come in, okay. and, uh, and that's yep. all he needs. You know? yep. and, and over time, you're down, a, you're down a path that you don't need to be down. Okay, and that actually leads to exactly what I think and believe. You never allow a gate of the enemy to enter your heart. Right? That's how Satan gets me or he gets you. It's like, it's just almost right. So you're, you're right, that's a gate. And why do you want to go in the gate? Well, because it's, it may be what is the latest thing. That's what everybody wants to do. It's what they talk about. No big deal. It doesn't hurt any and you start a gate. Well, what that gate leads to, remember, is not a gate that's leading to the right place. And I thank you for saying that. That's really what I meant to say. The, the reason why I said the yoga thing possible is, like you said, you have workout classes that they're not even going to get near to yoga or even talking about meditation. And, but you're right. You never want a gate. I would stay away from Yes. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a question, but I wanted to just say, when my seven, uh, seventh grader grandson came to me one day, he was so excited because, Grandma, I got to memorize the five pillars of Islam. <laughs> And I, this is public school, yeah. At school. And, and I said, oh, um, what did you learn about the Jewish religion? Well, we couldn't talk about that, but I memorized those others. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? <clears throat> Inside of the school system, if you think that the schools are the enemy is passive about bringing up the kids against Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, I could win that argument all day. They're 100% inside of our culture to be secular against Christianity inside of the Bible. And you could say, well, not everyone. Not every I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's, it's gone from, well, this is an idea or concept to they literally are teaching them, writing them this and forbidding them to see anything else. So the question I ask, I'm going to get to that with Dick, and I know Dick about the question. And what Dick was saying is, think about it. If we have a gate for ourselves... What kind of gates do we have our kids get into if we don't watch what they're watching or see what they're seeing, right? Or you say, well, they, you know, they have a phone, they can get in on it. You know what? Let me, let me tell you what the experts do. You don't want to be followed. They get a flip phone. Well, that's not cool. You get a flip phone, nice, cool-looking flip phone. Guess what you can do? You can text and you can call. 
I remember I had a group that came in years ago and they said, well, what if there's a shooting and there's a fire and there's whatever in the building? That's why I want them to have the phone. I said, get a flip phone. Oh, you aren't giving them a phone because of that. You're giving them a phone because everybody in school has to have one and you want to have one with it. Maybe you don't, but I'm just saying, you know, call it out what it is. The gates are what, with the access of the mind that we have today, those become gates. They can become in my life when you hear, oh, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. That's fine. That's whatever. Those gates become something that I, I don't want to let in. And I, I pray we need to pray more for the kids. And just what you heard, I've learned about the five pillars of Islam. And they make it sound so nice. Because you're not supposed to say anything bad about Islam. What's the uh, significance, significance of that black rock that they worship? In it America? was supposedly a stone uh, that was given by the angel Gabriel, okay, that they said was that. That's all that really read about. They believe that to be like a sacred stone uh, because it was given by the angel Gabriel to Abraham. This isn't a question, but um, a statement. I was talking to a Buddhist last weekend, you know, trying to do my job sharing Christ. Yeah. And uh, they have their truth, too. This guy's in, in their head anyway. Yeah, like, in their oh. head. And he wanted to do more talking than listening. But uh, I was patient. Anyway, he, he's like, well, we're all on the same highway. We just get to choose our own vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh. And I'm going to just make a comment on that because thank you, by the way. One of the things that the enemy Satan has done to me, to you, to everybody I believe in this country is we've got him to doubt ourselves. He's got us to doubt ourselves sometime that somehow the intellectuals in the world or the wonderful people that have it known or your movie stars know whatever it is or whatever it is that we've got our heads into that somehow you aren't going to know how to win this or you're not going to know how to talk to them because you don't know the special way. And I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way, but I bet you we all have. Well, we felt like we have been so degraded to be some people that can't even think straight or we're haters and we don't want to be that and that's terrible so guess what when we're meeting with the enemy you know what we're doing we're looking like well do you really kind of believe what you did i mean if you believe really that that's true wouldn't you just calmly stand there and say no i don't believe that's there's where we need to go and all i'm trying to do is remind you that you have been bought by almighty god and jesus christ and you're marked, and you're his, and you're his light, and I don't care what enemy gets out there, anybody stands here, they can say whatever you want to. I just hope that we all just stand there and say, you know what? I know what I believe. And I believe that. And you may not believe it. You may go in it, but I'm telling you, it's real. All of a sudden, the guy like over there is going, well, well wait a minute. Nobody else can say that. You in here I have a real heart for that inside of our Christian church. I, I really do. Is the encouragement of believers, of knowing that they, through the power of the Holy Spirit and transformation, can be witnesses in this crazy world in our last times. There's nothing that you don't have that hasn't been given to you that's greater than all this other garbage. And you know, I don't know if I'm the enemy. I want all of you to sit your uh, posterior... Glutus Maximus. I don't know what they say. <laughs> That's what I want you to do. I want you to sit in the chair. I want you to go to church. And I want you to expect pastors to be able to make it happen for you. While you sit here and listen, you think I want warriors out there? You think I want warriors inside of the church that are going to stand up and say, I don't care what you say. I know what I believe. And he bought me. And the enemy cannot handle that. I just pray for that encouragement in churches. If anything I have a passion for is to walk along and say, look at me. I, I mean, come on. Look at me. I didn't do anything, but I know what he can do. And I know that your life means something to someone because God's heart is he wants you to connect. That's what this whole thing is about. So if you leave that as we go next week, I just pray that that is the blessing that you can just in your life point to Jesus Christ. I went, I went three minutes over. Okay. 
I, I, I really mean what I said. That's the passion in my heart because I have so many intellectuals and people who speak like somehow there's some baloney. Everything we have is here. Amen. All right, let's pray. Hmm. Oh, Jesus, you are king. You are Lord of all. Thank you for the price that you paid. I pray for everybody in here. If they're believers. I know there's believers in here. Most of us are. If there's somebody who's not Lord, I just pray. Just touch your hearts or go over to somebody and just say, I want to know more about you. But I pray, Lord, that tonight, that as we're here, we may realize that there's nothing in this world that compares to you, Jesus. Nothing. In this world that we live in, how dangerous and how things are going, you rule and you will win. And we are lights to the world. I want to thank you for everybody in this room. Lord, just to bring so many people uh, who have a true heart for you is a blessing to me as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. And thank you for wearing the tags because we all forget each other's names. And I forgot to have you greet, so next week you got to greet a lot harder.